To be born English is to win first prize in the lottery of life. So said Cecil Rhodes, one of the grandfathers of British imperialism. At its height, the British Empire ruled over one quarter of the world's population and consequently exported Englishness to the furthest reaches of the globe. But what is Englishness? Is it stiff upper lips and fair play, village greens and tea and crumpets? And who are the English? Are we defined by a shared heritage, a common set of beliefs, by the language of Shakespeare? Or in a multicultural modern age, when more languages are spoken in England than in any other country in Europe, do we need to develop a new view of what it means to be English? To discuss and define the nature and characteristics of the English, I'm joined by Stephen Merchant, graduate of the University of Warwick, an award-winning writer. Thank you for having me. And Carl Pilkington, a man who, by his own admission, uh, didn't go to school, has no qualifications. Mention the head, talk about I'm the head. Head. I'm just trying to get to the point that he's not qualified in anything, or True. really isn't, uh, has no authority in any subject, or hasn't got the right to it. Talk got, about the head. And it was known the world over as a man who has a head like a fucking orange. You c- ah! All right. I think one thing that's very English is harping back and whinging combined. People saying, oh, England used to be better in my day. Oh, England was better when I was a kid. England was better in the 50s or whatever. Carl, do you think England's better now? Are you happier now um, than you were when you were a kid? Do you feel that life was better in, say, the 1950s? Uh, I don't know. I wasn't around. So, But you understand what it was like in those days? Um... You've seen happy days? I don't know. People always say, don't they? Old people always say, oh, uh, you know, it's a better life in the 50s. It was like, yeah, it was for them. Of course it was for them. They're old now. Being old isn't great, is it? So you're just happy with your lot. I suppose I was happiest at in about 1984. <laughs> right. Quite a specific year. Why? Why was, just, was that? It was just I was free and happy. How old, I mean? how old were you? I don't know. Uh, I to, uh, He's just counting on his fingers now. 12. Right, okay. And it was just good. So uh, the happiest days of your life were between the age of 12 and 13. Yeah, it was good. I had the world ahead of me. Mm. Um, Little did you know, your hair was going to fall out and you were going to whinge every minute of the day. I had my bike. I like messing about my bike. You had your mates. I had a pet magpie. So you were probably the teenager that you eventually hate? Probably. Were you a good lad, law-abiding? I wasn't bad. I just sort of, you know, just potted about. I mean, when people talk about what was on the telly back then, I I don't have that much memory of it because I was always out. I was always playing out. What were you doing when you were out? Just playing about, just like on a bike or... Just riding in a circle endlessly through you, blizzards, I loved it. rain, sleet, loved hail. It. I never seemed to be in. I was always... When, when everyone always goes, where were you when uh, Band Aid was happening? I was always out on my bike. And everything was like... Like you and McGregor. A, a memory's always sort of like coming in for some orange and looking at the telly and seeing Princess Diana's getting married and my mum says, have you seen this? And I'm going, oh, I'm going out on my bike. I was always doing that. The only time I was in my house. <laughs> this is why you don't know anything because you never stopped. Yeah, but this is what being a kid's about. But That's all what the I mean, information you have, Carl, is as though you've gleaned it as you raced by on a bike. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost like, you know, every piece of information you have. Your hair, it your is. hair blowing in the wind. <laughs> Carl, your hair will blow out one day. Oh, don't talk, stupid ma'am. So, yeah, 12 to 13 was good. But you see. And it was all downhill from then, was it? 13. It's your teenager then, aren't you? Life got tough. Yeah. How did it get tough? Just straight away when I was 13, my mum was like, you know, oh, it's your 13th birthday, you're a teenager now. Right. And she gave us a quid to go and get a cake to celebrate it. <laughs> Went to the supermarket, got a cake, and I just thought, I don't like the look of this. Don't like the look of the way the future is here. <laughs> <laughs> On his 13th birthday! <laughs> well, you were buying a cake, what, what did what you see at the supermarket? Just, that- it was kind of like, I don't know, I suddenly felt grown up. I didn't like it. But I think you were always about 58. Really, with your outlook? Well, yeah, my mum always said I was old. She said I was an old baby. She said I could frown before I could walk. <laughs> so they always had a bit of a worried look on my face. <laughs> Didn't say much, just always listened. My eyes moved about more than I did. Just sat there looking around, looking stressed. Uh, <laughs> my eyes moved about more than I did. <laughs> oh, dear, couldn't walk. Well, I can't walk, but I'll try and get a bit of movement in my face. Mm. Oh, it's no. a yeah. workout, a baby workout. Hi, oh, babies. Well, if you can't walk, what about your face? Let your face do the walking. It sounds like uh, that horror film. It sounds like Pilkington's baby. Yeah. <laughs> Just you lying there in your cot. I didn't like all the stuff that's set up for you. Like, me, me mum tried to send me to, um, like, a nursery. I said, no, I'm not having this. <laughs> Just like that. I said, I said when, I, when I'm older, this. when I'm older and I've got to go, I'll go. But let's leave out this bit. 
And she said, all right. She was, <laughs> I love the fact he could reason with her. I love him. He's like, he's three years old with a pipe. She's going, you're going to know. She goes, I, I think not, Mum. <laughs> I mean, kids don't play out, do they? Kids, you know, parents are scared to let the kids play out, and that's why the streets are dangerous now. Because no one's playing out on the streets. Whereas when I was a kid, everyone was out on the streets. The streets were safer. Because there was more people knocking about. Right. Let the kids play out. It must be like a constant, like a Larry painting, his front garden, do you know what I mean? <laughs> just loads of people just going, walking around. There was never around. any problems. I was sort of taken away by some fella. <laughs> what? Who, uh, I what? Whoa, 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 no, whoa. no I, was in, I was playing about in the garden. Yeah. But my dad's mate, Tony, yeah. he did tiling with him. He drove <laughs> past. And he saw me looking a bit fed up, so he just leant over, picked me up, took me to the pub. Now, the thing is, he wasn't panicked. People weren't going, oh, God, where's Carl gone? He's out. Just, just. Um, How old were you? He's down the pub. <laughs> yeah, he's, four, he's four years old. Yeah. <laughs> That's well, he's only having a. He's down the pub with Tony, probably playing darts. <laughs> Yeah, I was about three or four. Sorry, so some bloke drives by who happens to be a friend of your dad's, thinks that baby looks grumpy. Yeah. I'm taking him down but to the that's, pub. But that's what it Tony, was like. Tony, you bringing a baby to the pub? Uh, yeah, I might do. Yeah, we're all bringing ours. All right, see you later, mate. But that's what I'm saying. Whereas now they go, the baby's gone. There's a big full-on panic going yeah, on. Yeah, but I think it says more about your parents. They didn't do that. They looked out the back car and you were gone. Some bloke's driving off in a van. They're just going, oh, well, doesn't Princess Diana look lovely? <laughs> This is absurd. So what happened when you got down the pub? I just was there for a bit, and then uh, the for every bit, just had a game of pool. Then my dad came in. It was like, oh, there you are. Mm. Oh, there you are! I love that. Oh, where's my baby? Going to drive. Just gonna have a quick pint. Oh, there you are. <laughs> All right, mate. So uh, yeah, I think things were better back then. Rick, as you hinted at in your introduction. Um, the idea of Englishness and England, it's quite a vague term, isn't it? It's, you can play loose and fast with it. I mean, for instance, I was uh, looking at some quotes about England, and John Major, former Prime Minister, he typified England as being a place of long shadows on county cricket grounds, warm beer, invincible green suburbs, dog lovers, and old maids bicycling through the morning mist. Very yeah. specific vision of England. But he never came to the estate that <laughs> I was born on, sure. or Carl was born. You know what I mean? I, I, I think, I know of that. If we go for a walk around Richmond, we see people playing cricket on the village green, and, and it's lovely, but I don't know if it's it's typical. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I don't know where most people live. Um, but in a it's way, probably 50 50, isn't it, in cities and in the country, but, but that's wealthy country. But that's, interestingly, that's the vision of England that people like to subscribe to. When you buy your nan a, a box of biscuits for Christmas from Harrods, that's the image Ooh, of England that's on why the am front. I, why am I spending money at Harrods on my nan? Well, why can't I just, she, she's out with sort of like broken custard greens. You've, you've earned a bit of money now. Well, I know, but don't, they don't need to know that. I mean, also, b both my grand... The mothers are dead, so it'd be. It'd sorry, be a, that up, well, no, you? but I mean, who who buys their who who spends good money at Harrods on biscuits where she just suck them and and eat the Garibaldis and leave? The, I mean, I, I I don't know why I'm wasting money on the elderly. For I, a bit. I worry that you you've taken that too literally. I was trying to get to making more of a point, like an analogy, but I mean, I don't shop at Harrods. Right, Please, I don't. I mean, I, I mean, I might you know get some sort of Easter eggs. Two well, days after Easter. Well, what do you think of this then? Um, we were in Fortnum and Masons after Christmas, mm -hmm. and all and all the crackers were half price. Good idea. And there was a box of crackers for five hundred quid, down to two hundred and fifty quid. And I thought, right, that's got to be the best prizes anyone's ever seen. I'm going to get Cartier watches in these things. <laughs> so we bought uh, two hundred and fifty quid. I thought, oh, it's a bargain. It's half price. Got them home, pulled a couple, and there was a little notebook, right, that said wine notes. That's one. That, what? Wine notes. So you drink a bottle of wine and, and go- you make a note. Make a note of it, right? There was another one that had something that it was like opera notes or something. And then there was one for uh, uh, um, travel notes, like what, what country you were. I'm thinking, what world are these crackers for? It was putting a cracker and going, I needed it. Um, I've, I've filled up my um, uh, wine <laughs> notes book. It's not like- uh, 500 quid? Yeah. I mean, for some little notebooks. Yeah, I mean, if you'd have paid five hundred quid, I mean, I don't know who buys those. Well, I assume they're for presents. And it's I mean, probably the absurd, cliched, toff toffington Englishman yeah. who has no sense anymore of what 
were of any sense of worth of anything, and it's just a crazy, you know, snotty nosed inbreeding. There top. was a, there was a silver plated like muscle, you know, like, like the clam, the muscle, mm. right? You know, when you eat um, mussels, you scoop. I'm out with an open muscle. Sure. This is a silver plated one. <laughs> Who carries that with them? You get that out. We go, all oh, muscles. Good. Um, oh, good <laughs> oh, I brought it with me. My silver plated yeah. muscle to eat muscles. I'm um, wait, this wine's delicious. Let me make a note. <laughs> <laughs> That's absurd. But again, you yeah. see, it's interesting you said that because those are little images of what we would like England to be, aren't they? They're pandering to that image of what we'd all like to be that sort of upper class English person who's worried about fine wine and good food. And again, I mean, is, does, this, does this England still exist? I'm presuming there's a small minority that does. But well, there are some people that, that are in that world that are posher than the royal family. Yeah. You know, I can understand what the Queen and Prince Charles are saying, but there are some people... What? And I don't know what they're talking about either. Well, I was um, never really aware of class and the English class system until I went to university. Absolutely. That, I became I'd, aware of it then. Absolutely right. When I got to university and everyone sort of spoke like royalty, and that's when I discovered I was probably working class. But when I hear those people who do actually speak in that kind of, oh, Jeff, Jeff, you know, that sort of absurd, oh, rugger, oh, you absolute bloody well, you bastard. Know, you know they, what, though? I don't mind the mega posh people. I don't mind that. Ah, bloody hell, yeah. Yeah, of course, take one. Take one. Uh, you know, I don't mind one of those. Uh, what I don't like is the ones that um, stand around in all bar one with a rugby shirt with a collar up. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, those sort of, who are going to work in the city, yeah. and they're loud and think they're gentry, yeah. but they're, they're not. It's that middle bit. That annoys me more. That's sh- they've got this that confidence, but without any of the charm. But that's the England that I think people think of when they think of it. It's the four weddings and a funeral England, and yet it's not the England I experienced and grew up in. So, what is your typical image of an Englishman? Now? If I had to draw it for an alien, yeah, um, he'd be uh, quite squat, um, quite sturdy, sort of no neck. Um, hairy. Are you just thinking of yourself? Do you know what? I, it, it would be my build with Carl's head. Really? And no neck. Yeah, I think he's sort of balding and unshaven. And, uh, he's like a shaved caveman. I think he's, he's tough. He'd have tats. He'd, he'd eat like a dog. A Ray Winston type. A, 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 a sort of, yeah, that sort of, um, and he's Bob so- Hoskins. Just squat, strong, tough, doesn't take any messing, built like a giant wombat. It's the bulldog breed. It is the bulldog breed. I am thinking of the bulldog breed, yeah. See, now my image of an Englishman is is essentially that cliched one. It is, I think, f- Hugh Grant. So you're modern. You're straight well, away modern or, now. I would say, it's either mixed between Hugh Grant and Roger Moore when he was James Bond. You Do see, you know that's I mean? another that's another small percentage of I- Englishness that sort of annoys me. Those people that think they're James Bond, they think they can buy a suit and read GQ, and they're suave and sophisticated, and they get cars they can't afford. Or what they basically do: the people who think they're James Bond, all they do is work in a bank, come home, and flick through GQ at the adverts, looking at people in with wearing watches and aftershave. Who wears aftershave? Do you wear aftershave, Carl? Um, normally, it's, it, aftershave is the sort of thing I let other people buy me. It's like underpants. Underpants, tea towels, and sort of aftershave and that. <laughs> other people buying me. Who's buying you tea towels? My mum. Right, my okay. Mom, every time she turns up, she's got Brilla pads and stuff. <laughs> I've got loads of them. I keep saying to her, I don't need any of this, but she always brings a box full of stuff. Brilla pads, tea towels, underpants. The underpants size hasn't gone up since I was 14. <laughs> But that's, I can rely on her for that. So do you not have anything in your life which you would think of as being gentlemanly? Do you ever dress smartly? What about suits? I bought one suit that time when you invited me to the BAFTAs. That's the only suit. I wore it for the BAFTAs. I think I wore it for one other thing. I haven't wore it since. I don't like, I don't feel comfortable. It's not me. But don't you go to a wedding? That'd be a lovely advert, wouldn't it? Him with a suit on going, I haven't wore it since. <laughs> Carl Pilkington hasn't wore it since. <laughs> I don't go to, to weddings. Wedding. No, I don't like going to them. I agree. I mean, even though you know them, they don't give you any time when you're there, do they? 
They just sort of, they don't know whether you're there or not. They're on cloud nine. They don't know who's around. It yeah. doesn't matter. You don't need it's to all, be there. With them, when I'm ready now, it's all me, 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 isn't it? <laughs> oh, what are they like? I know, unbelievable. You don't even get to make a speech, do you? Although I know you were annoyed, Steve. Steve doesn't like to part with money. I, don't, I mean, I'm mm. not, I'm, I don't know what the politically correct term is. Stingy cunt, isn't he? Mm. He's fucking mean, right? And uh, if he ever has to spend out on like, a wedding gift to someone he's known, you know, all his life, um, they look down the list and they find things things under twenty five pounds. Then if he if he bothers spending that much, he's furious when someone an usher goes just stick it there. Oh, it drives me insane. You spe- well, firstly, oh, I, I'm annoyed about the wedding list. I don't know when that's come along because I don't know why I can't just bring maybe something I've made at home. <laughs> no. <laughs> Why has there got to be a list of stuff? What bride, what newly married bride doesn't want a pair of homemade clogs? Exactly. Do you know what I mean? And then you arrive there and it's just, oh, thanks very much, stick it on the table. Uh, oh, but the saying that, I think people very much appreciate you being at their wedding. No, no. They do. I, they remember if you were there. No, they don't. They do. They don't. You don't get invited to weddings because you ain't got any mates. No, I have. I've got, I know enough people. Everyone's getting married. But it's, they're always in the middle of nowhere. That, no, that, that annoys me when people say, come to our wedding. Yeah, fine, we're, we're in Greece. Yeah. Well, no, down the road, I might make it down the road for the reception. Yeah. Go to Greece. What? You want me to book a holiday and come to your wedding? Well, the thing that drives me insane when you do go is when they put you on a table with people you don't know. Well, that's I've got it. all my mates there and they put, what, because uh, I got to mingle with some people? I don't care, I don't need these people. But that's what people. I'm not good at, I've talking to people friends. once. Talking to people who you don't know. No. What, what sort of stuff would you make conversation about at a wedding? Uh, I'd probably say, oh, first of all, how do you know them? How do you know the people getting married? Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, like, you know, do you think it'll last? <laughs> <laughs> imagine getting... Uh, imagine inviting Carl Pilkin to do it and going, <laughs> oh, where should we put him? Oh, I don't know. Is there a, is there a table for one? <laughs> oh, just... You'd be imagine, on the table with the kids. Imagine being stuck with Carl Pilkington at a wedding. Yeah, what else? So you've asked them, do you think it'll last? They've gone, I'm sorry? Who are you? Uh, Carl Pilkington from Manchester. Right. Yes, we think it'll last. What else would you ask? What was your next... Um, you know it's going badly They're sort of like Looking down their nose at you They're thinking Why did they invite This bald headed seems, scum There's just the, the last wedding I went to It's going back A couple of years But everyone seems A bit snidey <laughs> Do you know what I mean Because you've got A mixture of families There haven't you Yeah And none of them Really like each other no. And I got stuck With an old fellow Who had a flatulence problem <laughs> That so fun. And then he went on to say, it doesn't matter, the suit's hired. And it's just kind of... <laughs> I'm going to die! I, I love just don't that. like him. I love it. He's basically saying at a wedding, it doesn't matter if I shit myself. <laughs> oh. To be born English is to win first prize in the lottery of life. So what do you think of that, Carl? Uh, may- maybe... Uh... Uh, maybe it's that thing that I don't appreciate what I've got but to me being English isn't anything that great really? why not? because uh, it's just what I've been dealt with but what would you uh, having I mean I know you know nothing about the world um, you've travelled nowhere you've no, seen no, nothing yeah um, but if you could be any nationality what would you be and why? Um, probably be Italian. Okay, why? Well, just uh, yeah, I like the idea of it. I like uh, Italians are all right. Aren't Where they? would you live? Rome. Probably, I probably wouldn't want to be in in the middle of Rome. It's too much hassle. Have you been to Rome? Yeah, it's nice to visit and stuff, but it's just I wouldn't want to live there. It's you've got to get paperwork done and that if you just want to put a picture up because everything's old. Everything's listed. He's, it's already, it's, he's only been Italian about three minutes, and he's already slacking <laughs> he's it off. He's already no, no, But I like, I, I like, I like there. Rome. Yeah. It's good. A lot of old stuff. Why and have you chosen Italy? I'm interested to know why of all the countries you've chosen Italy. I was a late comer to pasta, <laughs> <laughs> but it's one year round. I like it now. It's like one of my favourite things I have. Um, which there isn't really anything like that in England. That even though well, it's, well, except pasta. Pasta's no, almost exactly it's, like it. Yeah, no, but we've got, we got pasta, It's we? not ours, though, is it? And we no, don't know we got, how to eat it. What do you mean we don't know how to eat we, it? We do it all wrong. You stick, look, it, you stick look, it up your arse again. Look at me. I know how to fucking eat it. No, but what I mean is, if, if you saw a proper Italian and they saw what we did to pasta, 
they would not be happy. What are we doing wrong? Tell me what we're doing wrong. Well, I don't know that, otherwise we wouldn't be doing well, it wrong. Well, how do you know, know we're doing it wrong? You know I've just heard do. we do it wrong. It's like how we we have the coffee at all the wrong times. I ordered a cappuccino somewhere and the Italian fella said you shouldn't be having that now. It's a breakfast coffee. Yeah, it is, yeah. Before 12 o'clock. Yeah, yeah. but I was having it at like quarter to 11 at night. Oh, it looks wow. Like well, that's mental. absurd. How are you going to get to sleep with a lovely cup of coffee? Yeah, that's, that's Well, a I don't point. sleep anyway. You do shouldn't I? drink coffee anyway at night. There was cappuccino or frappuccino or mocha. Doesn't matter. Don't drink coffee after about four in the afternoon anyway. Full stop. So, hang on. So, you love pasta, but you're not eating it right. So, you'd like to be Italian in order to be able to eat pasta correctly. Even though you enjoy the pasta you what eat. What do you feel being Italian uh, is, and what, what's it's attracted just, it's to being... It's just very sort of... Um, it's a relaxed lifestyle. Whenever you go to Italy, everyone's sat outside a cafe. It doesn't matter what sort of... Carl, you are. that's all you do now with your spare time is yes, sit outside a cafe. But they get more respect over there for Why? It. It's, it's like, it's okay to do that. There's older people sat outside cafes who do nothing. I and love it's just the fact for, that he wants to be retired. Italian so he can sit outside a cafe and get more respect than he does now sit inside, outside a cafe. No, but everyone's rushing about here. People have, like, colder coffee. They have frappuccinos here because they haven't got time to have a hot coffee. It's <laughs> like they've got a coffee with icing so I can neck it. Get it down <laughs> my neck and get on with my day. Relax, enjoy your coffee. I don't understand the rush. <laughs> you but, never but, enjoy anything. You say that you don't enjoy anything. You don't enjoy a coffee. When you're having a coffee, you're probably going, oh, I, can't, I don't know if I can enjoy it yet, in retrospect. And tomorrow, I'll go, oh, I like that coffee yesterday. But the reason you enjoy Italy is because when you were there, you're on holiday. That's why you're able to chill out and no, relax. No. When you say that it's old people, old people sat in some little Sicilian village. Of course, they, they got no money. <laughs> Here, I went to the Salvation Army. Right. Why? Because it's nice. What do you mean? You get you get you can get toast and a cup of tea for a pound. Go, <laughs> oh, you little skinflint! Right, you little roundy heady. There's nothing Scrooged. skinflinty about that. That's just that that should be the going rate, Steve. I'm surprised I haven't seen you in there. To be honest. <laughs> but the thing is, where is now, it? Now, just near Camden. What is it? Is it like uh, old people? A lot of old people, mainly old people. Um, and this is what I'm saying. These are people who are old. And they sat in a cafe, but they don't get any respect. People are walking past and they don't want to go in. The way you reacted when I said I was in the Salvation Army, that's the reaction they get. Yet an old Italian person, they looked after better. Well, it's certainly true they look after their older families, don't right. they? they do and that's all I'm saying. Whereas, I mean, it's a lovely place, Salvation Army. Every old fella in there's got a tie on. Yeah, they make an effort. Uh, that, that that chokes me when I see an old boy still put a shirt and tie on. He he's, was. he's he's ninety. He's like been through hardship, and yet on a Sunday. They're still shining their shoes, and you know what I mean. I mean, you sometimes can't even bother to put your trousers on. I know, I know. Well, I've got an elasticated waistband, yeah. and they're, they're still fiddling with braces and buttons. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, that's that's what I like about Italians and that. There's a, there's a lot of. So you respect. want to be Italian because when you're old, you can sit outside a cafe and get more respect than you do here. Yeah. Look at the old people in this country. They never look happy, do they? Really. Most of the time, when you see them walking around. They, get, they go to pot. No one's keeping an eye on them. Well, it's an important thing, isn't it? That, that um, My uh, my mum, this is when she was about 60, 65. Uh, there was a, a neighbour who was, uh, uh, you know, 85, 90. And, um, again, completely alone. And my mum used to go on there every day. Do you want any shopping? Do it, right? She, she, was, she, was, she was good for us. She was like her witness in the world, you know, to her existence. But I remember calling her once and... Uh, She'd come back, I said, what have you been doing? She went, oh, I've been around so-and-so. So I went, all right. She went, oh, she won't die, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> like, she's out for yeah, her, but she's yeah, thinking, yeah, this yeah. is getting silly now. You were meant to go years ago here. <laughs> <laughs> was, I, 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 <laughs> well, that's the problem, you know. If you if you get pally with an old person, yeah. then you could be stuck with them for years. And having to do stuff, you know, that's what you don't want to do, is it? You, you, you meet an old, you know, an old fella, and then you've got to start um, popping in is sort of piles or whatever when he can't do them himself. You know, what do you do if you're... It depends how friendly you are, though. I mean, I'm just talking about someone you meet at the bus stop as opposed to popping the piles back in. <laughs> <laughs> how does that happen? <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> just the ones on, on the estate I grew up on. As soon as he got to a certain age, it was Mrs Knowles who went mental. One right. day she seemed fine, next day she was chucking cans in everyone's garden. <laughs> you... you could just hear her coming. <laughs> Which was weird. Actually, now you've brought up weird people. There Go was on. a fella called Shorts Man. Right? <laughs> it's so 
pedestrian. <laughs> oh, I love that. Shortest man wore some shorts. No, no. What I like, yeah, he did. But they were they were really short. They were that sort where, you know, it's almost pointless having them on. What do you mean? They were just you know like shorts now for blokes. Yeah. They go up to your knees, don't they? There's yeah. no chance. There's no accident happening there. There's go nothing going to pop out. Yeah. No. But shorts, man. He liked it. He liked the fact that that happened. Right. And he used to walk with with big strides to sort of help the chance along. So that he what? knew with the big strides and the short shorts, yeah, they were going to pop out. Did you ever see it pop out? Yeah. Why did you look at the shorts? Just because it was it was like it was what like it? it was like playing Buckaroo. <laughs> it was like when are they going to pop out? But what? <laughs> <laughs> it just what happened. So wh- right, but so shorts man. <laughs> So he was an exhibitionist. He liked he bossy white people to yeah. see his veg. Yeah, and they were out more than they were in. I mean, they, they had a tan, right? <laughs> now the thing is, what what we like in England, I think we like that. We like local characters. The eccentric, yeah, yeah. eccentric's very. That's very British. Eccentric, yeah. And, and yeah. I and I I'm glad I grew up round there with all them people. So they're am interesting. I. Well, there is a certain uh, mindset about you know, the great English, certainly the older English people. I mean, my. Grandparents are, you know, my grandfather died recently, but the amazing kind of eccentric, very English, seemingly um, no friends from what I can identify. I don't know if this is unique to them or true of a lot of English people, uh, older people, terrified of what the neighbours might say. They always did that thing of speaking like that in case I was here. Yeah. What Jack said next door. Yeah. Like the, like the neighbours are constantly listening in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They've got glasses against the wall. They're constantly listening into what my grand's got to say. Yeah. Um, they had about three teeth between them. It was extraordinary. <laughs> my grandfather had a, a plate of false teeth during the war that had a wooden palate. A wooden upper wow. palate with teeth on it. And those teeth slowly fell off during the course of the years. Never got, got replaced. Worm. So you, they'd sort of invite you to Sunday roast and they would get, they would wake up at six in the morning to put the beef on and they wouldn't have it till six in the evening. <laughs> they would cook it. The biggest compliment you could have uh, if you made some food for my grand, if it was some beef, would be, oh, you're so lovely, this, so tender, you can suck it away. <laughs> she, if you could suck your Sunday roast through a straw, she was happy. Well, yes, you didn't have any teeth. Right, exactly. Basically, they got to about the age of... 60 or something and it was as though they were just waiting to die it was strange they and they lived for another or my grandfather lived for at least another 25 years <laughs> <laughs> so it was you must have been gutted but in a, when my father uh, my father needed a winter coat a big heavy winter coat and he was thinking of buying one and um my grand said oh don't worry about that ron you can have your father's winter coat and um he said well but but you know he's he's still alive. What do you talking? You know he, he needs it when the coach. She went, no, he'll be dead soon. Just don't silly to waste it. Seems to waste it, you know. Just wait. My father must have been waiting ten years for that winter coat. I love the fact he waited. You can, <laughs> you can see where did. Steve got it from. Of course Worth he did. Waiting. Stupid. I'm waiting now. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, you must be freezing. I am cold, but I'll tell you, it's a lovely coat. <laughs> In English society, traditionally and now, is manners. Mm. I mean, obviously manners change, but etiquette. what is etiquette? What is good manners? Um, I think that a lot of that has been lost. Well, I was thinking the other day, have you ever heard of the finishing school? Carl? Yeah. Yeah, of course. Do you know that? Uh, no. The idea is that, you know, the sort of gentrified ladies, after they finished their education, they would go to finishing school, where they would literally be taught, you know, how what, to... Knives and forks, walking with a book on your head, just things like what to say... I mean that's. I mean it's like it's it's like a, a year of being Eliza Doolittle, isn't yeah. it? Don't put your elbows on the table. You start start from outwards, going inwards with cutlery. You know, you eat soup, the spoon goes away. There's things like the the fork. Uh, you're never meant to face those prongs uh, up. That so you either stab your peas. Or, you know, mm. there's ways of eating soup. You know, the spoon needs to be moving away from yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. And scooping it up and bring it back to your mouth. I mean, it's crazy, but, you know, the people that subscribe to that stuff would look at the way you live your life, the way you eat your food, Carl, and would be appalled. Yeah, but In the same way we think that's absurd, they would think you're a disgrace. But who's, as long as you're enjoying it. No, they would say no. Well, no, there are certain things that I can't stand. I can't stand eating with the mouth open. I think that's rude. I, 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 I ban chewing gum on the set of a film because it, I think it's rude. 
I think it's rude that people stand there talking to you. Yeah, but we all know you're a preposterous hypocrite. I mean, the way you no, eat food, come on. No, I don't eat with my mouth open. I don't... Uh, I do eat with just my right hand, smash it and scoop it in, but, then, but I see nothing wrong with that. I would say it was slightly rude when you're ordering the bill and getting up to leave yeah. when I'm still finishing my main course. Yeah. I'd say there was a touch of rudeness But I go into that. a restaurant to eat. Yeah, but you're supposed to wait when you're with the other people and let them finish as well. This is my ideal restaurant. It is empty. They know what I want, and it's waiting for me when I walk in. I leave, still chewing, and I go put it on my bill. That's yeah. the ideal restaurant for me. Yeah. You're pretty much there. From yeah, I, I, try and, I try and... That's what I try and, try and do, yeah. Um, but, you know, there are certain things... I am one for manners. I think I, I hate rudeness. I hate lateness. I hate all those things. But some of them are ridiculous. The albums on the table is arbitrary. Why? I mean, there's a reason you say please and thank you because it shows courtesy. Um, th those make sense. There's a reason you don't talk when you're eating because it goes over and it's disgusting. There's a reason you don't lick your fingers and then put it back in the chips because someone else has got to share that. But don't put your elbows on the table or or start with that fork. I think it's ludicrous. You know there's those rules when you meet a member of the royal family. For instance, if you were at the royal variety performance and you met the queen, mm. there's various rules they yeah, tell you, you do, about. Yeah, you don't fart or call her love. <laughs> exactly, for, for one. But also, you don't speak until you're spoken to. You have to do a slight bow. I was um, invited to the, the palace a couple of times. The first time was after the office sort of broke. And I got an invite. Um, a company of the, Her Majesty the Queen would like you to come to a one of those dinner parties, and um, I know what you're thinking. Why didn't you get one? Yeah, that's exactly what I'm thinking. Well, well, well wait, wait, wait. I was I was a big shot quicker than you because I was in it. Um, don't forget, you didn't appear until um, but uh, even series so, two. If we'd if we'd split the atom, they would yeah. invite both of us, <laughs> not just a guy who does the press conference. <laughs> so, so the thing came through, and I thought, oh, I don't, I didn't. I, I was worried about it, to be honest. Um, but it just said, I will be attending, I will not be attending. Tick the box. And I couldn't bear to just tick, I will not be attending, because it was too harsh. So there was an RSPV number, and I phoned up, and it was obviously the the head of the house, or a butler, or I don't, I don't know, someone. Who, and he went, hello, Buckingham Palace. And I said, hello, it's Ricky Gervais, I just got an invite to come and... Um, and... I, it sounds weird, but I couldn't bear to just tick, I will not be attending. Um, I just went, he went, well, you're the first person ever to bother to do that. Thank you so much. I went, oh, um, my pleasure. Sorry I can't make it. And, but I, I don't think that's weird. It is strangely brutal. It is strangely brutal, isn't it? I wonder if they've changed it by now. Yeah, there's a little asterisk. Thanks to Ricky Gervais. It now <laughs> says... <laughs> I am too fat and lazy and busy eating cheese to visit your majesty. I, what I think is this, that no one's ever ticked, I will not be attending. Right, yeah. So it was never a problem. Until, so why until, did you not want to go? Um, I don't know, I just thought it was a bit intense. And um, I'd be, I turned down all those things. I, I think I would like to go now, just to look around. Yeah. Um, I don't know, I just felt a bit funny just being invited there. I, I was invited to all those things at the uh, um, Downing Street as well. Mm. And I just thought... You're inviting me because I'm on the telly now because I'm famous. Well, where was my invite when I was on the doll? Yeah, do you know what I mean? With respect, I wouldn't have invited you, <laughs> <laughs> circa 1983. <laughs> no, I haven't got a problem with um, you know going to the palace or um, except I do have a problem with sort of being wheeled around as as a celebrity. Because I used to think if I was ever invited uh, to get given an MBE or a knighthood or something, I'd be like, nah, I'm not part of the system, you know, I'm a rebel, I'm outside. Now I think it would be be quite cool. Well, I only think it's a problem for a comedian, because, you know, we're sort of meant to dish it out, and it's difficult to dish it out if you're being seen. What I do find weird is the idea of having to bow and scrape before people because I'm told to do that. Well, like, I, I, I what I find is that idea of I'm, I'm, a, I'm obligated to be respectful to such a degree just because someone's the queen. Like, obviously, I'd always be respectful, but why can't I speak when she turns... What, I don't understand. That's why I find a strange what idea. What would you say, though? Well, I just say, you know, honour to meet you, Majesty. But, you know, I don't understand why I can't initiate that. Why, if I, but I, I don't find think she'd mind that. If, if you went... If you went honour to meet you before she'd spoken what she's going to say she's going to go cheeky cunt <laughs> I talks first lanky <laughs> Carl what do you think about all the pomp and circumstance around um, 
It's it's all alien. It's not it's not for me. I don't like that sort of. Uh, I, I try and not put myself in the same sort of circles as as posh people because it's just a different. It's like a different club, isn't it? It's like like I said to you about young people and old people. There's such a different life going on. They say like the the whale and the hippo are related. You never see them together, and it's the same with with really posh, you know, well off people. And someone who's just getting on with the life, but it's but I mean uh, that's the thing that's changed as well. The stiff upper lip thing, that's out of the window now. I mean, it, it's like everyone's got a new addiction. Everyone's oh, I'm addicted to drugs, alcohol. I'm addicted to sex. Not a problem. Have a wank. <laughs> and everyone's got depression now. I Can don't you be addicted to sex if you're not getting any? Because <laughs> <laughs> if that's the case, then. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear Do you think there's a big difference, Carl, between the, the Englishman of year, yesteryear who didn't complain I mean, he just got on with things He might have whinged about the weather and the like um, But he just got on with things He carried know? an umbrella Yeah. He Whereas didn't nowadays about anything. people are getting their Prozac and their antidepressants Someone, They're someone going into therapy Yeah, he kept out of stuff as well uh, Just did uh, the war and so and so Alright, they're coming this way If they come over here, give them a slap why are we getting involved now in everything? Thoughts on that, Carl? Uh, it's news now, isn't it? Sometimes I think, don't tell me. Don't want to know. Just get on with it. Whoever's job that is, get on with it. Yeah. Why am I being told about it? When I've got a problem in my job, no one else knows. No, no. one helps me out and goes, well, I've got an opinion for him. No. This might help him. No one helps me. But I'm being bombarded by everyone else's asshole. <laughs> they love talking, actually. That's what the English do. Talking, but they never finalise it. They'd love just being in the meeting room, talking, saying, yeah, we could do this, we could do that. I'm the only one in that room not getting paid. Everyone else is on a wage. <laughs> I'm there looking at me watch, thinking, right, I've been here for an hour, nothing's been sorted. <laughs> They're looking, thinking we can drag this out for another half hour, get us to lunch. That's what annoys me. They're all sat there, just pushing bullshit around the room like dung beetles. <laughs> Sick of it. And that's what the English do. <laughs> and it's a shame, because I don't think we used to be like that. I wish everybody just sort of kept to themselves more. Like, you know, certain animals do. They just get on with it. It's like, like an old-fashioned way. What animals keep well, any, themselves? Any animals keep themselves themselves. Like what? Said, like loads of things. What, what, keeps, what animals keep themselves? Badgers. <laughs> <laughs> Why do they keep themselves? Just, no, they just... Uh, when, whenever you've seen them just sort of wandering about a roadside, they're on their own. Right. They're, not, they're not sort of... What are they doing? In pairs. I don't know. Most of the time, they're dead. <laughs> I've seen more dead badgers than alive ones. I've never seen a live badger. <laughs> I don't so know what his point is. So that's is. why they're one alone and two getting on with it. I love it. Most I of love the time. It started off as some kind of poetic analogy. <laughs> I don't know what that was. <laughs> Most of the time. I just. Uh... <laughs> oh, God. Um, I like this thing of the, the, the Englishman I knew growing up um, was uh, you had to. When you hit a certain age, when you hit like. Manhood or puberty or whatever, 13, 14, 15, you had to start showing your metal. Then the most important thing then was to, uh, well, the worst thing to be growing up was gay. That was like, you couldn't be gay. That was, it couldn't be gay. Anything mm -hmm. but gay. Um, and then you had to be hard, you had to be tough. I'm, I remember, right, when I first started going to pubs, right, so I'm, I don't know, say 18, you walk into a toilet, the urinals and the first thing everyone did was fart and gob <laughs> yeah that was it right yeah, if yeah. you couldn't do that then uh, you know you get funny looks you yeah. know you go in the rhino and they'd look at you and go, oh sorry it yeah. was all about um being a man <clears throat> You know, I think wearing glasses makes you slightly exempt from that. It's like you don't have to. People mm. automatically dissociate. It's like if I was in prison, I wouldn't have to do that because I'd just be the professor. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I mean? Exactly, or brains. Yeah. I would. Yeah. I, they would, I wouldn't need to be part the... of it. I'm never a threat because I never look like I'm going to be a tough guy. So consequently, I live in this sort of parallel stratosphere where I haven't got a piss and gob. Yeah. Has that got more popular? Yes. Has it? Yeah. There's a lot of people doing it in the streets now. Really? It's not like in, avoiding... Not in Hampstead. It still is, you know. When I wa walk The only in, person it's... gobbing in Hampstead is me. Jane says, don't gob. People are looking. Well, it is. It's your trail that I'm seeing then. <laughs> it's like a load of sort of washed up jellyfish in London. Just big blobs of it. I, d I mean, I don't know how they're coughing this stuff up. I mean, they shouldn't still be alive. Some of them have, like, organs in them. It's just big lumps of stuff. <laughs> I mean, that list of 
idyllic, antiquated England of, uh, you know, tea and cakes and cricket, I mean, is, is valid. But I think the things that sum up Englishness, I mean, talking of the weather, I think drinking, uh, war, we love a ruck. Yeah. We built on war. We're a warrior race. We're pretty good at war. Or we used we to be. are good. We used to be good. I don't yeah, know if we're no, we're very good. We're, good. we're good. We're very good. I mean, we th- I think we reached our peak with Churchill. Probably that's probably our, our greatest uh, hour, our finest hour. According to him. Yeah. Well, he should know. He was there. He should know. And he liked to drink, didn't he? He loved a brandy. He's not afraid of a drink. He liked to. He'd get pissed up, and he'd no wonder he'd fight him on the beaches. He'd fight him anywhere. Yeah. See, there's an example of a posh bloke. It was like I was saying. He'd lead you into battle. He'd have a weapon too. He'd go in there. He didn't. He didn't sit back. I mean, when he was old, he did. But nothing wrong with being posh if you're willing to go and you know get stuck in. What do you think, Carl? Um, is it as scary though? I mean, imagine if if he was rougher sounding, and he was on on the front line. And, like he uh, went, he went. You fucking little cunt! I fight you on the beach. Uh, look, see me down in Brighton Monday. I'm gonna fucking smack your head in, you little fucking German cat. Like that, you mean? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's of a morale boost. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the other point of one, isn't it? That he was. Those speeches were for as much as morale as uh, information and and defiance. You don't want to feel like the the leader of your country could glass you if you got on the wrong side. No, of exactly. It's got to be. It's it's got to be rules under war, hasn't it? I mean, that fair play has got to come into it as well. Talking of the. Um, English sense of fair play and war. When um, the crossbow was invented, a lot of people wouldn't use it. They said it was unchristian. So our soldiers sort of resisted it. So Europeans got this thing that needed no skill and it was shooting these bolts and they could reload quick. And uh, versus our, our bowmen. What do you think of that? What do you think of going, oh, it's cheating, we won't use it, but having a disadvantage? That's honour, isn't it? It's almost like it's okay to kill someone, but with skill. But uh, what's the problem here? What am I meant to be worrying about? Well, you've got you've got bow and arrows. Yeah. They're amazing. They're heavy. They're, they're your arms. They've got they've got trained bowmen. They're skilled. The most skilled sort of marksman uh, uh, soldiers in the country. Someone comes along, and goes, "Don't worry about that." Is a crossbow? Just pop it in, put it back. <laughs> Deadly. Deadly, quick, anyone can use it. So now you've got anyone with a crossbow killing people. Women, children. Anyone can use it. So the Europeans, they're going crazy. Oh, William Tellen is, they're, they're shooting apples off heads. Yeah. Right? But we did, we resisted it because we thought it was, you know, unchristian and cheating to kill without skill. What do you think of that? But where were the where were the actual bows and that being made? Because that's the thing, isn't it? The the the, the company who's making them, they just right. want to get out to a big market. Brilliant. That's that's what they do now with the iPod and everything. It's not about people wanting more music than ever before. That's not the case. It's about having having the accessory. And if the bow and arrow was like sold as this, you know, light to carry for all the family. <laughs> that's that's how it would have happened. That's what it's all about. <laughs> Ye new bow and arrow. From Ronco. But what what do you think the problem yeah, is? Yeah, but you're not quite getting Ricky's point. His point is the idea of there being sort of rules and fair play and etiquette in war. The I objective don't, I don't is think to kill the place, enemy. I don't think war and that is a place to start getting all uppity about someone cheating or having a better Ooh. system. Really? You think all fair in love and war, do you? Yeah, definitely. Right. Well, it's just about rules, winning. isn't there? No, not in a war. There isn't rules. So what about things like the Geneva Convention? It's the understanding that even if we're entering into a war, theoretically, there's a set of agreed universal rules. It's good for both sides, rules. isn't it? Fair play has got well, to come into the, everything. The, what's extraordinary about the idea of English fair play is, you know, famously the, you know, the approach during the First World War, that we would sort of walk up out of the trenches onto no man's land and sort of politely march at a slow, steady pace across towards the I enemy. Know. I mean, and then we were just being machine gunned down. I mean, it was absurd. Well, I, I know we were fodder. It was fodder to use up some of their bullets. I mean, it was crazy. But, I mean, it's madness. But in a way, it's it's the gentry who are leading us, seeing you know the average Tommy as a sort of as well, cannon fodder. Of, of I mean, course, it's of course. And you know, you've got to realise that most of those people didn't want to be there. Most of them didn't even understand it. I mean, and if you think of the first and second, you know, they were just wars. You know, but um, I just I can't just can't imagine How what it'd be cope, like. Do you think, Carl, in a war situation, you've seen all those f- films of the? Uh, I mean, that's the one they had a, had a 
knockabout and stuff, didn't they? They took you know, the game of football in no that. man's land. Yeah, Christmas Day. But who, who took a football there? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> if I was on the front line I would not be getting out the rule book I can tell you that much I'd be going mental Are you saying there should be some rules or no rules? I mean you've got to have some rules Otherwise it's, it's just going to be like Grand Theft Auto isn't it? I'm just going to go about battering everyone Yeah. And you soon get bored of that mm. So I think you've got to have some rules right. Which rules would you repeal That already exist That you don't like? Uh, it's a shame you can't tip as much as you used to be able to. You mean in a restaurant? No, just when you're getting rid of a mattress or something. <laughs> <laughs> so fly tipping, you'd but like to see more what, fly what, tipping. What, what just, do you mean? This is something so personal, he's fed up, he had to take something. No, it's, okay. it's just that they used to put stuff outside the house and just like, you had mattresses, you had sideboards, uh, sewing machines. The thing is, it was it was a good way of recycling. Now, they say recycle... But we're not recycling. It's just being put in a bin. So you'd like to see more fly tipping? <laughs> no, not... You see... You That's see, what we need in London. More this rubbish. Is, this <laughs> is the problem, you see. Look what's happened. Look what's happened to what I've said. It's been taken the wrong way. Right. I'm not saying tip. I'm not saying chuck your bin bags out the door and let crisp packets go everywhere. I'm saying if you've got old furniture, you should be allowed to leave it outside your house without the council going, move that, it's dangerous, someone's going to trip over it. Mm. Well, if right. they trip over it, it should have been looking where they're going. Well, what if they're blind? What if they're blind? That's why you don't leave things out in the pavement, because blind people will fall over them and smack their face in. What if a woman with a couple of kids in pushchairs has to go out into the road yeah. to get past and your get, piece of junk? And get crushed. No, because I'm I'm leaving it. I'm not leaving it on the on the pavement. What well, you just said you were, where are you leaving it? Sort of outside the house. Right. In well, your front garden. Well, who's going to take it from there? That's just thieving. No, sort of just Where are you leaving it? Where are you leaving it, Carl? You haven't established where you're leaving this yet. Because so far, a blind person's fallen over and broken his nose. I've never seen a blind teeth. person trip over anything. You've never seen a blind person trip over anything? Definitely not. They're, they're better on the feet than some people, because they're more cautious, aren't they? So it Make it more fun for them, if anything. Why can't you just have this stuff collected by a second-hand shop, or because send it to a Because they don't come, charity. Steve. Honestly, they, they don't. They I've, I've called up people, and they're saying, yeah, we'll be there in an hour, and I say, right, I'm going to put it out on the street, and are you going to come and get it? Yeah, we'll be there. An hour passes by. They haven't been. Suddenly the council all goes over the past. Place. <laughs> on the floor, <laughs> bloodied noses. Then the council said, I call them up, do you want to shift it? Well, we might, but don't know when. Well, it's outside the house now. Well, you can't leave it there. It's your responsibility. You'll have to stay with it. Suddenly I'm wasting time sat outside my house with rubbish that someone else might want. But mm. you're not allowed to leave there because a blind person might come along. What's the dog doing? <laughs> what... Do you make of St George, the patron saint? What's your take on that? Is he the one who killed a dragon? Right. Tell us the story. There was a dragon problem. Yeah. Where? Um, must have been in England. Right. Um, George took it on. He took on the job. He was like a rent a kill. <laughs> uh, <laughs> he came out. The interesting thing with him is, right. He was a hero then. I honestly think if he did that now, there'd be an uproar because it's the last. It's the last dragon. It's the same way we try to save the panda and all that now. If he came out and said, "I've done it," and they've gone, "Done what?" So they've just killed the last dragon. They'd, they'd go mental. There'd be marches. <laughs> idiot, bloody idiot. <laughs> and that's what's interesting. But it was it was going around burning people. Doesn't matter. We should have. We shouldn't have killed the last one. It's the last one. And that's no, what we'd be do, like. So you should have saved it. You should have captured it and put it in a cage so we can all look at it. There's no stuff. point. It couldn't have bred anyway. It was the last one. Was it definitely the last one? <laughs> <laughs> well, you were saying it was the last one. I'm not bothered either way. Well, hang on, what? To me, Sorry, hang on. Whoa, 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 whoa. So you think that there were dragons? Well, what are we celebrating then? Well, it could be a metaphor, a dragon slayer. It could be. Um, a, a bad thing amongst us. It could be a foreign threat. It could but, be things that threaten. Aren't it? it could be anything. It could. It's not. It's not to be taken literally, is but it? But the real legend of George was that he was a figure who uh, stood up for Christianity. Doesn't have you ever done anything brave? There was a kid at school who used to have epileptic fits a lot, and uh, the teacher used to always say, "If it happens, grab his tongue." And I sort of had a go at that once. His tongue. His tongue. Yeah. What it was? What? What do you have a tongue for? To pick stuff up. What do you mean a tongue? His tongue in his mouth. 
Oh, his tongue. Oh, his tongue. Yeah. Right, go on. And they used to say, the if, he, if he starts, if he starts doing it, uh, grab his tongue and that. Yeah. And and I sort of had a go at that once, and it was wasn't nice. Well, how did you grab it? Well, you grabbed his tongue, did you? Well, I tried to. It's like grabbing a slug. <laughs> And plus his mouth's going up and down that, you think he's going to have me handy. So you sort of do that thing where you go- So you were fight- you were trying to grab hold of a kid's tongue, yeah? And he was- f- He's dressed. throwing himself all, o- all over the place, it was in a physics lesson. I sort of had a go and then I thought, this isn't happening. So I just sort of kept putting my hand in, like I'm having a go, but I, I, in my head I was going, I'm not going to get hold of it. What you could have used is a pair of tongs. Well firstly, I don't see why this is brave. Uh, kids having an athletic, athletic fit and you're just supposed to help them out. I don't know why that's bravery, but even given that, the fact that you were thinking more about yourself in that situation than this other kid, you were thinking, I'll make it look like I'm helping, but I'm not really. And yet, this is kid having well, an I athletic did, fit. Well, I did at the beginning. Doesn't I that tried. sum you up, Carl? Selfish. No, no, it doesn't. Because at the, at, I didn't, no one else was having a go. At least I did try and grab it you at one point. You weren't doing anything. You were just making it look like you were. It's, have you ever tried to grab a tongue? <laughs> it's <laughs> like chasing a, a chicken, <laughs> it's murder. <laughs> And after a while, it wears you out. And it was weird anyway, because it, it was like I, a I, What was he doing it for? I don't know. Like, wearing him out after hours of chasing love, this kid's tongue. I love the idea of you ever tried grabbing a tongue. It's a, it's a valid question. I love that he's annoyed. He's annoyed that this what poor you, kid's uh, What was your technique? Did. Were you trying to grab it? Just, sort of like just with your thumb and your, what's it, finger? Like, like, yeah. a, like a pincher thing. Yeah. But it was, because his mouth's going down and... Was he, he shouting or just... No, just throwing himself around. So that's your one attempt at bravery. Well, hang on a minute, let me just think of Trying to else. grab a tuck. There was a time you were chased by a bee and you scored a goal. Oh, I forgot about that. <laughs> that, that. That isn't really bravery, is it? As you were, as you were running away from a bee <laughs> and the ball happened to hit oh. your foot and go in. Oh. That count as bravery. Oh. I love it when he goes up to the pearly gates and goes, well, you know, have you done the act of courage? Uh, I pretended to grab a tongue. <laughs> a what? A tongue. A tongue. Yeah. Uh, got chased by a bee, scored a goal. It doesn't count as brave at all. Well, what have you ever done? Well, it's a good question. I thought of some of them. When I was a kid on the beach, um, there was a, a baby, like a toddler. I was about 12. And uh, they were out, their little boat had gone out. The mother had missed it and they were miles out. And the mother was sort of distraught. And I swam out. And uh, I was a good swimmer then, and I pulled it in, right? And she bought me a box of chocolates. It's not enough, is it? What? It's not enough, a box of chocolates. I'd have been furious. <laughs> really? I'd have wanted a lot more. I didn't expect anything. No, it was like when I found that old lady's purse and I sent it back to her, and she didn't. She sent me a little thank you note, but nothing. No cash, nothing. I was furious. I thought, come on, I've just, I've kept. I could have kept that purse. I sent really? it back to you. I di- I need more than a little thank you note. But I didn't. I didn't expect anything. I was. I was sort of. Uh, I wasn't even particularly proud of myself because I just thought, well, I could just, I could just do it. it what, I mean, if it happened now, I'd go, "What's in it for me? I've just eaten." <laughs> exactly. I'd go, "Is that your kid? They're miles away." <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> I've got less brave. He's I've got out. more scared of the world. Yeah, the things I used to do: jump off sheds. I used to jump down flights of stairs to see if I could do it. Walk along, walk, you know, all those things that kids do, and um. And you lose your nerve, I think. After apparently, if you haven't bungee jumped by your thirty, you never will. Really? Yeah, you sort of. I think it's a sensible gene kicks in. I, I'm pretty sensible. Yeah, you think, well, if this is not worth dying for. Don't do it. Mm. You know. Yeah. Um, but uh, I think having glasses prevents me from doing a lot of things. <laughs> no, seriously, because it's hard to be brave with glasses. Because <laughs> if I stepped into the middle of a fight and there's people being bullied and I stepped in, <laughs> my glasses come off. That's it. <laughs> No, now I'm just being bullied as well, but I'm also yeah. blind in this. So I'm just crawling. It's very hard to strike fear into your opponents when you're crawling around on the floor looking for your frames, going, "Don't step, don't tread lightly, tread lightly." That's two hundred quid there. Oh god, I love that when you took up judo and you think you overheard the yeah. judo instructor say, "Just knock his glasses just off." Just knock his glasses off. But why are you? Why are you? Who are you, Woody Allen? What are you doing in this scenario? Why are you stepping into the dojo wearing a pair of glasses? Well, how anyway? am I supposed to do judo without? Where am I supposed well, to? Well, they come off immediately. But what am I supposed to do? Not do any form of martial art because of the glasses? I don't know. Actually, I haven't thought about that. Exactly. This is the problem, isn't it? People don't think that. You never see boxers with glasses. Well, of course you don't. Right. Exactly. So I got no kind of athletic role models in that way, except. Dennis Taylor. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, a man with glasses. Me and my glasses. Hey, so tell you this, I could I could write a book on the difficulties of having glasses. But I suppose it's completely. 
affected your life, hasn't it? it? Has. Everything you do. Of course it has. Absolutely. Fashion. Fashion. Yeah. Um, certain sport, dancing, moshing. Can't go in a mosh pit. <laughs> Can't, you know, I've always wanted to jump on the stage, you know, <laughs> take my shirt off and then jump back in and everyone catches you and they sort of, you sort of swear along on top of everyone's hands. Can't do it. The glasses would come flying off. But how do you swim in the I'd sea? I'd have to hand them to the singer and then do it. <laughs> I, I went to, um, I was in India recently, I went to Goa and I got myself a pair of prescription goggles. Could not believe my luck. It's revolutionised my swimming experience. All right. Pre- goggles which have got the same lenses in as my glasses so I can all right. see. All right. That's good. Went in there. Uh, literally, I, and they're pricey as well. Went in the water within Love seconds. It. Giant wave had come over, and it was crazy. It was like real all over again. It ripped off both my trunks and my goggles. They went flying off my head. What? No, I, I can only grab one of them. My like trunks have my never trunks. come off. Maybe once well, I've dived in, they come down no, they, a little bit. They came loose and they slipped down, thus revealing penis. Goggles came off. I off. reckon you're but like you know shorts, what? man. I think you've been doing it on purpose. You know how most swimmers tie your shorts up, Steve. <laughs> no, I'm just going to see. But if they but come you know, off, you know, if they come off, then you might see something. You know how most uh, swimming goggles would float. Yeah. My prescription is so dense <laughs> <laughs> that they just sunk straight to the bottom. <laughs> ah. I think it's a well-known fact that most English people think God is an Englishman. Okay, I don't know if all nationalities think that. God is their nationality. Let's assume, let's forget all the impossibilities of his existence and say there is a God. Do you think he's English, Carl? Yeah, because that's all you can think, isn't it? Well, why? What does he look like? What does God look like in your mind? Like like everyone else sees him now. I've seen pictures of him. I've seen too many pictures that, mm. that get in the way of, of altering that image. So he's, what is it? He's a big... Big fella. Yeah. Big hands. Yeah. Um, sort of Santa Claus figure. Yeah, but a bit more, a bit more like a dock worker, a bit sort of musclier. Right. Now, what has he got to tell? He's a big, he's a big dock worker, airy fella, airy chest, airy back maybe. Got big hands, right? Calluses where he's been making stuff, made the world yeah, and that, didn't yeah, he? Yeah. Yeah. Big, big feet. Um, so okay, yeah. And he took. Uh, what's his accent like? Um, I imagine quite a friendly ac- accent. I imagine uh, sort like of Richard, Richard Attenborough. No, a bit rougher. Uh, Brian Blessed. You Somewhere mean rougher, more working class? I just mean like, um... Does he talk like, uh, you, you aren't a fucking, I've made the world. No, 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 no. no. More no. Jamie Oliver. No, no, yeah, that- no, more sort of, um, Brian Clough. Brian Clough? Brian yeah. Clough. That sort of style, like, you know, take no nonsense from you. You, yeah, you can have a joke with him, but you I know you've that. stepped the line without him. Now, Derby County were unfortunate to lose 2-0. Actually, I'm thinking, no, not not Brian Clough. The Brian Glover. Brian Glover? Oh, in case. Brian Glover? Yeah. So God is a Yorkshireman, then? Yeah. Well, isn't that a phrase as well? I think it is, yeah. God is a Yorkshire. So no nonsense. I speak as I find... Let's let's get this done. We've yeah. got to make world and planets, yeah. and we've only got six fucking days. Yeah. So you've got this god figure. He's a big fella, docker, talks like that. No nonsense. Uh, is he naked? Doesn't he close? Does he? He is na- He's naked. I assume. His top half's naked. What's he wearing? On t- what's Just it? Just sort of like um, loincloth. No, more um, Bermuda shorts. No, more French knickers. Uh, Pajama bottoms. Pajama bottoms. No, a thong. Uh, joggers. Just joggers, okay. White right. ones. White jogger, okay, right. So but no, there. no shoes. Flip flops. Flip flops. So flip flops. So he's on holiday, I suppose. It's like he's done his day, he's done his six days, yeah. and the rest is on holiday. He's done it all, really. Now he just sits back and. So, okay. Now, supposing you were the first man, Carl. You were Adam. He's made you there out of the dust, right? There you are. You're lying naked on the ground, okay? He's just finishing off the knob. You're doing the knob, you wake up. Okay, he's just... Mm. What, what do you say? So he's got he's got me knob in his hand, has he? <laughs> mm. This is the this is the beginning of life for me, is it? As soon as he opened my eyes, I'm not seeing lovely nature and the sun and the black, bright blue sky. I'm seeing a fellow with me cock in his hand. Yeah. Uh, right. He's so shirtless. What do you, what do you mm. say? So he's a bloke, right? He's got lovely tats. He's got a beard. He's from Yorkshire. All right, son. Right? He's got... What do you say to him? I'll say what you're doing. Right, he says, I'm just finishing off the cock. Just so I've made you. Right. I'm just right. finishing you off. And why Why am I just waking up at this point? Why could you keep me on the for a he's bit He's breathing more? life. He's breathing life into you. And where do you think he breathes it into? It's like a valve, isn't it? He's like, it's like a lilo. The, the penis he uses as a valve. So he's blowing life into you. Right. He goes, right, great, brilliant. He went, do you, do, you like, do you like me touching your knob? Not really, no. Why? It should feel pleasurable. 
No, I don't. I don't like. Can it. I tickle your testicles? I'd rather you didn't. Why not? To check What's out. To check they're working. He's got. Yeah. Can yeah I but don't mess with them. They're fine. They feel a bit fragile. Stop <laughs> messing with them with your big hands. <laughs> <laughs> so you're going to say to God, stop blowing life into me. Stop tickling my testicles. Leave my cock alone. He's in charge of everything. Don't you want to know why it feels nice? Don't you want to know why it, there's blood rushing to it? It doesn't feel nice. I've just woke up. This is my first experience of life. We always wake up. So, yeah, it's morning. So, so it's I'd the morning. say I'd, I'd, so I wouldn't be up. happy. I would not be happy. Why? But you don't know. I think the animal bit in me would no. say, you, this isn't right. When why? I was in hospital with kidney stones, and that fella came round and had a quick feel me bollocks without telling me he was going to do it, I didn't like it, but what I didn't say What do you mean he had a feel without telling you? He just, he just came round one morning and so said, how was, are you? Was he a doctor or just something? <laughs> Right, he was the doctor bloke, <laughs> right. but he just came round and had a feel. He didn't right. even say he, he was going to. Patient. It just, just <laughs> happened, just happened quickly. Yeah. Now, I didn't like it, but I thought, well, he's a doctor. And the, and what I've been taught as a as a human yeah. is that <laughs> you, can't, you can't attack him. If I was a cat, I would have bit his hand. Yeah. And that's what I'm saying. The animal in me would have come out initially. Right. So what? You'd have been you'd have been uh, aroused. You'd have been like no, you'd have come out no. of the closet or you'd have come no. what do you mean? Would you have been like, oh God, oh would you have been relaxed or stiff? Steve, this has got nothing to do with Englishness. Well it's no, mental. I'm just trying to think what an Englishman just, does. I've got to sit through all this. <laughs> <It's> shit <laughs> If I should die, think only this of me, that there's some corner of a foreign field that is forever England. There shall be in that rich earth a richer dust concealed, a dust whom England bore, shaped, made aware, gave once her flowers to love, her ways to roam, a body of England's breathing English air, washed by the rivers, blessed by sons of home. And think this heart, all evil shed away, a pulse in the eternal mind, no less, gives somewhere back the thoughts by England given, her sights and sounds, dreams happy as her day, and laughter, learnt of friends and gentleness, in hearts at peace, under an English heaven. Rupert Brooke, the soldier. What an, what an amazing poem that is. Yeah. It's a shame you read it, though. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the Ricky Gervais Guide to the English. That's it for a little while. Five in that series of guides too. Plenty to be going on with. Plenty to be going on with. There's also the, the, the rest of the back catalogue as well. And we might do the odd free one. But we'll be back soon anyway with maybe um, another series of guides too. Who knows, Carl? Thoughts? I've enjoyed this. Have you? Yeah, my favourite ones. I like learning stuff, you know that. If we're going to learn something and make a few quid, I'm happy. Mm. Mm. Unlike the people who are listening to this who have, are down two quid and have learned absolutely nothing. And what they have learned from you is total bollocks. So, thanks. That's goodbye from me, Ricky Gervais, Stephen Merchant. Goodbye. And Carl Pilkington. Right.